So now we're on record. Before I proceed, I want to find out if I'm audible enough. Can you people hear me? <coughs> yes, please. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, did someone say no? Okay. So let's um, let's move on. Uh, today we're looking at inductive reasoning. In our last class, we did deductive reasoning. <clears throat> and we're saying that deductive reasoning is reasoning in which the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical. <clears throat> we say that like mathematics, the meanings of the contents don't matter. You know, They don't matter for the validity of the argument, whether the contents are true or false, you know, don't count in determining the validity of uh, a deductive argument, you know. So a deduct, an, an argument could be valid, a valid modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism, whether it is true or not, you know, if, the argument is true, then that's that's the choice of the person who is making the argument. So all that mattered for deductive reasoning is the relationship between the premises and the conclusion. It has to be logical, you know. Then for inductive reasoning, the relationship is not logical. It's possible to affirm all the premises and deny the conclusion without contradiction. Remember the example we gave of inductive reasoning. 95% of men are honest. Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. We say there are two possible conclusions. Peter is honest, Peter is not honest. So that means that you can affirm all the premises and you can deny the conclusion without contradiction. You know, you can say 95% of men are honest. Peter is a man, Peter is not honest. There's no contradiction. You know. So then that's because the premises are capable of producing more than one conclusion. So in that case, when you are dealing with an inductive argument, you need to look at the meanings of the contents and then use common sense to, to determine for yourself whether you know, this argument is close to the truth because um, inductive arguments are first, first of all, they are not valid. What you want to find out is how close are they to being uh, correct, they can be. They can't really be correct. They, 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 you are just judging them by their closeness to the truth, not that they are true. You know. So inductive arguments, premises provide reason for believing in the likelihood of the conclusion. So that's a deductive argument. Believing in the likelihood. But the premises do not guarantee the conclusion. So inductive arguments are probability arguments because inductive arguments do not depend on rules. They are harder to evaluate. So it is more difficult to evaluate in an inductive argument because you are looking at more than one possible conclusion. If an argument has only one possible conclusion, you don't need any energy to evaluate it. It is when you are faced with more than one conclusion, then you, you, you know that you have some work to do. Then verifiable and confirmable statements. Now verifiable statements are statements we can directly test or verify. They are usually factual or empirical statements, verifiable statements. Example, Kofi lost trend with age. So this is a verifiable statement. But confirmable statements are statements we cannot verify directly, except through verifiable statements. Example, all men lose trend with age. Now look at their combination. You have premises that are verifiable statements and then you have uh, conclusions that are confirmable statements. So you can see that the premises can be directly verified the conclusion cannot be directly verified. So that's how, that, that's how you, you see inductive arguments. 
you can directly verify the premises and you cannot directly verify the conclusion. So that tells you that for an inductive argument, the premises are most of the time factual statements. Factual statements. Okay. Another example, Mary reached menopause by 40. Grace reached menopause by 35. Meredith reached menopause by 33. Rose reached menopause by 34. Edith reached menopause by 38. Sophia reached menopause by 45. Therefore, half of all women will reach menopause by 35. So this is another collection of factual premises leading to um, a confirmable conclusion. So the conclusion is a confirmable statement. <clears throat> How do you detect a confirmable statement? There are two ways of detecting confirmable statements. First of all, they are not directly testable or verifiable. We've seen that. And, but secondly, is that they can be converted into conditional statements. You can convert a conditional, a confirmable statement into a, any statement you can convert to a conditional is a confirmable statement. It's not a verifiable statement, it's a confirmable statement. But you cannot convert a factual statement into a conditional. It is only a confirmable statement that you can convert into a conditional. So whenever you're able to convert a certain statement to a conditional, then you know it is a confirmable statement. Look at this categorical statement. No leader steps down from power unless compelled by a coup or constitution. Now to convert it to a conditional, if X is a leader, then X will not step down unless compelled by a coup or constitution. And so that tells you that it is a confirmable statement. Now, this is another clarification we need to make. We made it in the last class, finite and infinite reference classes. We said that the finite reference class is a class of countable items. Examples, this copper, that man, some boys, that table, and so on. And then the infinite reference class, a class of uncountable items. Example, all metals, all men, all voters. Now we need that clarification because of this. Remember I talked about confirmable statements and they are usually the conclusions of inductive arguments. Now there are two kinds of confirmable statements. You have the ones we call the law-like hypothesis and statistical hypothesis. So that tells you that those confirmable statements, which are usually the conclusions of inductive arguments, the conclusions of inductive arguments are not only confirmable statements, they are also called hypotheses. A confirmable statement is technically a hypothesis. Law-like Hypotheses are confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. That is, they use the infinite reference class. Example, all metals expand when heated. So that's a law-like hypothesis. Now look at it as a, in a conditional form. If X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. Now look at another example, all Fs are Gs. Each F is a G. No Fs are Gs, all Fs are not Gs. Now, law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. G must be attributed or not attributed to every F, you know? Okay, all men are mortal. If Peter is a man, then Peter is mortal. So anything that is a man is very absolutely predictably mortal. So if you say that equality applies to all members of a class, then it means that any member of that class must have that quality. So the predictability is 100%. But if you are saying that it is not all members of a class that have 
a certain quality and you say you identify a member of that class then we start debating whether the person has a quality or not because it's not all members of the class that have it so that's why we say that law like hypotheses are highly predictive now look at statistical hypotheses Confirmable statements referring to some percentage less than 100% and more than 0%. Example, 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. You know. So uh, uh, confirmable statements, or, or sorry, statistical hypotheses don't work with only percentages. They also work with some other terms like some, few, many, most, hardly any, and so on and they are less predictive. If X eat the food, S is likely to fall sick. Uh, if you now, so because it's not a law-like hypothesis, the predictability is lower. If it was a law-like hypothesis, that is if 100% if of those who eat the food fell sick and X eat the food, then X surely will fall sick. But if it is 90% or 70% or lower that eat the food and X eat the food, then you don't even know whether X is among those that fell sick. The predictability is lower than that of a law-like hypothesis. Confirmation versus proof. So inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. Now, when we say confirmation in logic, it is not as strong as confirmation in real life. That is, you know, when we talk about confirmation, we normally say that confirmation is proof. This has been confirmed. So it's like it has been proved or it has been demonstrated or it has been guaranteed, you know, that kind of thing. But in logic, confirmation is not as strong as that. Confirmation is not up to proof. So inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. Deductive arguments are aimed at proof. Confirmation is not proof. So evidence confirms, but does not prove the truth of a hypothesis. So that's why we say inductive arguments are not valid arguments. Now, how do we detect inductive arguments? Two major ways to detect inductive arguments. First of all, they are capable of more than one conclusion. So we already know that. 90% of those who ate the food fell sick, Ama ate the food. We have two possible conclusions. Ama fell sick, Ama did not fall sick. But another way of detecting inductive arguments is that inductive arguments are extrapolations. They are extrapolations. An extrapolation is an activity that smuggles in information into the conclusion that is absent in any of the premises. So, when you smuggle an information into the conclusion without passing through the premises, the premises don't contain the, the information, but it has been smuggled into the conclusion. All inductive conclusions contain information that is not accounted in the premises. So we'll see that as we move on. Now, this is the technicality of induction. A known thing A, has certain properties such as X, Y, and Z. Another thing B that is not in the premises has the same properties X, Y, Z. Now, so A and B have three properties, X, Y, Z. Then A also has some additional property Q. But you don't know whether B has Q. You have not checked to see whether B has Q. So on the basis of the above three premises, the argument concludes or in reality extrapolate that B also has the additional property Q. So you say premise A has X, Y, Z, premise B, uh, sorry, premise A, or uh, premise one, A has X, Y, Z, premise two, B has X, Y, Z, premise three, A has Q, conclusion, therefore B will also have Q, you know? So what is the reason why you think B has Q? Because B already has three other properties that are the same as A. 
so the idea of induction is that if A, if B is like A in some respects, it may also be like A in other respects. But you know that that is not a, uh, an accurate, a very strong argument. You know. So that, that conclusion contains information that is not accounted in any of the premises. None of the premises tells you that B has Q. You know. Directions of extrapolation. So now um, we've seen that inductive arguments are extrapolations. There are different directions of extrapolation. First of all, we have part whole extrapolations, attributing something to a whole that constitutes a part or parts. We have two types. We have generalizations and statistical uh, syllogisms. Generalization, Peter is strong, James is strong, therefore all men are strong. So, so this, this is called a generalization. We are generalizing from Peter and James to all men. <clears throat> so you can see that it's not a very strong argument. <clears throat> then we have statistical syllogisms. Most Canadian university students drink alcohol. Caroline is a Canadian university student, therefore Caroline drinks alcohol. So you can see it is not a very good, the, the argument, actually has two conclusions. You can also say Caroline doesn't drink alcohol. So that's how bad the argument is. Then we have analogies, arguing that something possesses the same thing as another because they both possess some other properties. So we just saw that right now, but what we are now bringing it here because it's called analogy, argument by analogy. Example, <coughs> the structural adjustment program was good for Cameroon which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Uganda, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Senegal, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Nigeria, which is a third world country. Therefore, the structural adjustment program must be good for Togo, which is a third world country. So this is an argument by analogy. The argument is based on the fact that these countries share a particular common quality or property, which is what? That they are third world countries. Because of that, the argument reaches a conclusion that something that worked in one of these countries or some of these countries will work in the others. So you can see the argument is not uh, foul proof. It's not, it's not exactly the best of arguments. Then we have predictions. Attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of frequency of past occurrences of the same quality in similar events. Tyson has won his last 30 boxing fights. Therefore, Tyson will win his next boxing fight. But what if he loses? So the argument is based on, based on the fact that he won the last 30 to say that he will win the next one, you know. But there's no information in the premise that supports the conclusion. And information has been smuggled into the conclusion that is not contained in the premise because the past is not the future. So this is a prediction. So, and that means prediction is a kind of inductive reasoning. Two kinds of enumerative inductive arguments based on strength, or basically what we want to look at two kinds of inductive arguments based on their, uh, on their strength. One is supposed to be stronger than the other, you know. Now, an enumerative argument is an argument with many premises. That is, you are kind of enumerating the premises like a list. The first kind of argument is the one, the first kind of inductive argument is the one that with a law-like hypothesis as conclusion. And then the second one is the one with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. So this is the one with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. 
So we have 10 premises. Gold expanded when heated. Silver expanded when heated. Bronze expanded when heated and so on. So 10 different metals expanded when heated. And then the summary premise is that all the metals tested so far expanded when heated. Then the conclusion that all metals expand when heated. Now the technicality, premises one to 10 are verifiable of all particular statements. The summary premise is a summation of all the verifiable premises, but the conclusion is a confirmable and general statement. So the argument is strictly invalid. It involves jumping from verifiable to confirmable statements. That's why confirmation is not proof and inductive arguments are not valid. Now let's go to the argument. Let's go back to the argument. Premises one to 10 are verifiable statements. And the summary premise is also a verifiable statement. All the metals tested so far. But the conclusion is talking about all metals. Remember I told you the last time that all the men is not the same as all men. All the men can be counted. All the men in this class, all the men in this university, all the men in this town, they can be counted, but all men cannot be counted. So the, the, the two are totally different. Now we're seeing the same thing here. All the metals tested can be counted, but all metals cannot. So this argument involves jumping from a particular statement to a general statement. So that jump is fallacious. Uh, the information about all metals is not contained in any of the premises. So the, 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 the premises or even their combination cannot give you any warrant for saying something about an infinite reference class because all the premises are about the finite reference class. So even if you have tested 10 metals, you can't reach a conclusion about all metals because uh, we don't know all the metals. We have not discovered all of them. There are still that, some in the ground And in fact, the conclusion is false because some metals in fact do not expand when heated. They are called superconductors. They don't absorb heat, so they, they can't expand. So the conclusion is false and all the premises are true. And that is why I said it is possible to deny the conclusion of an inductive argument with all true premises or affirm premises and deny conclusion. And that is applicable to all types of extrapolation, part whole, analogies, predictions. So we are done with inductive arguments. We've seen how they are. Now let's see if we can compare inductive arguments with deductive arguments. Let me take a few minutes to uh, shut my door. Uh, so just give me two minutes. Okay, so I'm back. 
So we're done with inductive arguments. Let's try and compare inductive arguments with deductive arguments and see some interesting things. Now, by now, it is already clear that deductive arguments are, are accurate compared to inductive arguments. Deductive arguments are accurate. Deductive arguments are accurate. Inductive arguments are not accurate. So that one is already clear from the beginning. But what we don't know is that deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the inability to provide information. So deductive arguments are accurate, but it is difficult for them to provide you with information. Now look at this example. Number one, either it is raining or it is not raining. This is a disjunctive statement. Either it is raining or it is not raining. Now this sentence will always be accurate. If it is raining, this sentence is accurate. If it is not raining, the sentence is also accurate. So whether it is raining or not, this statement, this statement will always be correct. But does it tell you, does it give you any information about whether it is raining? It doesn't. It doesn't tell you whether it is raining or it is not raining, you know. So it is accurate at the expense of being able to provide you with information about, about uh, rain. The same thing with number two. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. So this one is a conditional statement. If it is raining, someone will get wet. And it is always correct. If it is raining, someone will get wet, so it is correct. If it is not raining, someone will not get wet, so the statement is still correct. But does it tell you, does it tell you whether it is raining? It doesn't tell you whether it is raining. It doesn't give you information about whether it is raining. So that's why we say deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of being able to provide you with information. On the other hand, inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. So with inductive arguments, it is the other way around. They provide you with information, but it is at the expense of their accuracy. Now, those information, those pieces of information that are smuggled into the conclusion of inductive arguments, that is the information that, you know, the new information that inductive arguments provide, but they stand the risk of not being correct. Sometimes they are correct, sometimes they are not. So inductive reasons, uh, inductive arguments are generated because of, the chances that they could be correct. Remember, inductive arguments are often correct. Okay. If you say 90% of, uh, if you say 90% uh, of those of men are dishonest, Peter is a man, Peter is honest. Sometimes that argument is correct. Sometimes it will not be correct. So because of those times when the argument is correct, inductive arguments are valued. So inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. But providing information, to provide information is to be falsifiable. Now, whenever you provide information, the information you have provided is falsifiable. For example, it is raining right now. If you say it is raining right now, the statement is falsifiable. It is possible that the statement can be false. So it is not like deductive statements. Now, it is really right now. It could be false. It could be true. It could be false. In fact, right now it is false because where I'm staying, it is not raining. So right now, for me, the, the statement is false. And if it is not raining where you are, then it is false. If there's any of you who is living, who is staying maybe in Kumasi or somewhere or in the north, and it is raining there, then it is true. So the statement can be true, it can be false. So that's what we mean by falsifiability. Whenever you provide a piece of information, that information is falsifiable. Falsifiability and science. 
any valuable empirical information must be falsifiable. Any statement that is not falsifiable cannot be a verifiable or confirmable statement. Any statement that is absolutely true has no empirical content. So you can see that you saw, you saw statements one and two, either it is raining or it is not raining. If it is raining, someone will get wet. They are absolutely true, but they don't have any empirical content. If an information has an empirical content, then it will be falsifiable. Now, the more valuable the information, the more falsifiable the statement. So if you say it rained just now, if you say it rains every third Friday of the month, and you say it rained just now, these are two statements. Which of them is more valuable? Which of these two statements is more valuable? You calculate the valuability by asking yourself the number of things you can do with a statement, with the information you've gotten. Now, if you say it rained just now, then I can make arrangements that will benefit from the rain. If I'm a farmer and it rains just now, I can decide that tomorrow morning I'll till the soil because the soil will be wet and soft. But that will be only for tomorrow. The, the information it rains just now is only for today. So it, uh, it is useful for me only for tomorrow, only for today and tomorrow. But if you say it rains every third Friday of the month, then as a farmer, I will decide that every third Saturday, I'll till the soil. Or I'll go to the farm and do something, you know, because it has rained. So the information it rains every third Friday of the month is more valuable than the information it rains just now. That is how you calculate the valuability of empirical information. You calculate it by calculating what people can do with it. But the more valuable the statement is, the more, the more valuable the information, the more falsifiable. So it will take only one third Friday of not raining to falsify the first statement. You know. Now let's look at the second kind of inductive argument. Arguments with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. So this is an example. And this example is about people who are vaccinated for polio. Some still suffered polio after the vaccination. Some did not suffer it after the vaccination. So Michael was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Gilbert was vaccinated for polio and suffered polio. Mary was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Stanley was vaccinated for polio and never suffered. James never suffered. Bob was vaccinated and suffered it. Jill never suffered. So, uh, Samuel never suffered it. John never suffered and Carol never suffered. So summary premise is that eight out of 10 people who were vaccinated for polio did not suffer polio. So the conclusion is that polio vaccination has 80% potential of preventing polio. Now remember that eight out of 10 people is 80%. So that's why the conclusion is that polio vaccination has 80% potential of success. So the conclusion is a statistical hypothesis. You can compare it to the law-like hypothesis, all metals expand when heated. So you can see that this kind of hypothesis is safer. It is, you know, should I call it better? Or well, it is more prudent compared to saying something like all metals expand when heated. This, this particular hypothesis looks more scientific, you know. And you will be able to defend it better than you can defend a law-like hypothesis. So we have two types of inductive arguments. We have the ones ending with law-like hypothesis as conclusions, and then we have the ones ending with statistical hypothesis as conclusions. Hypotheses are technically regarded as conclusions of inductive arguments. So I mentioned that very early because they are confirmable statements to be supported, confirmed, or denied by verifiable statements. 
So this is the end of the class. We'll do causal reasoning next week. And um, remember to watch your lecture videos regularly, um, read your textbooks, do all the exercises in them, check your Sakai and WhatsApp platforms for regular information. So right now we'll take questions. Anyone who has questions can ask, we'll address the questions and then I will upload this video immediately to your Sakai and all those who didn't attend this class can watch the videos. So if you want to ask a question, you raise your hand and then we address it and close the class. Laurentia. Yeah, I thought Laurentia raised her hand, but her hand is down again. So, um, well, the lecture is a pretty straightforward one. Uh, you can watch the videos again later. Emmanuel Opoku. Sir, so good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, so please, can you say how long for doing some of this before COVID-19 is a very judgment? No, I wouldn't answer that question. It's supposed to be part of your assessment. You can, you are supposed to be discussing these things in groups. Do you discuss in groups? No, sir. <laughs> So that's very bad. <clears throat> We're supposed to be discussing in groups. In my undergraduate days, we discussed before our exams, we discussed, and even the assessments, we discussed our topics in groups. It helps you to understand them better. And then, I mean, you pull your resources together. You, you lean on each other's strengths. Okay. And it is a very, very, very good, um, so the fact that you you guys are not um, the fact that the, the the pandemic doesn't prevent you from discussing in groups. You you have WhatsApp groups. Apart from Zoom, you have WhatsApp groups. The Zoom itself is free. You have the free one, forty five minutes. You just link up with some friends, discuss some things, and I mean. Uh, you, you you check the amount of communication you do on social media. You, you can just convert it to <laughs> discussions. Mm -hmm. Stop discussing fashion and designing and, uh, <laughs> and 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 the and the politics of Ghana. When 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 you have not gotten anywhere, <laughs> but get a job first before you discuss politics and if, even before you discuss fashion and those things. So, please. The amount of time you spend on social media, spend them on academics, call people to be discussing inductive arguments, deductive arguments, and all those things. I used to discuss in groups, and I can tell you that anything you discuss in a group, and, or anything that was said in a group, it doesn't go out of your memory. But anything you read on your own, you sat down to read alone, the, 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 the possibility of going out of your memory is 70%. Okay, so now if there are no other questions, then I'm going to end the class and uh, remember to do your textbook exercises, which I'll be meeting when? Saturday, Saturday by the same time to do causal reasoning. So until then, I wish you the best. Keep working hard so that um, you will all be great. Goodbye.